Well, now, you know, we, we've gone through a few introductory sessions so far. Now we start getting into the meat and potatoes, okay? And uh, leading off this section is, uh, is Larry from Calzada. And uh, Calzada is a, a part of the uh, a team of corporations that are uh, backing Zen. And uh, I'm sure he'll go into that as well. So uh, how about a big round of applause for Larry? Got it now? Okay. So we may be a small group, but do we have the best badges that you guys have seen? <laughs> I don't know if Lars gets credit for this or Russell or who, but there are a lot of people walking around with badge envy uh, <laughs> when they see these big boys. So. Actually, the Linux Foundation. <laughs> wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. I was impressed when I, when I got that. Um, so we're going to turn the, the focus a little bit and the filter that we look at, at Zen at. Um, and uh, I'm going to come at this from the angle of an ARM server perspective. Um, so you heard a little bit about that in the, the first presentation this morning. I'm going to go quite a bit deeper here. Um, and <clears throat> so it's, it, 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 it's going to give you a perspective um, of, relative to a lot of things you're hearing this week in terms of cloud, uh, big data, obviously virtualization being here today, but looking at it with um, some significant innovation that's really coming into the data center via ARM servers. Um, so a little bit of background myself. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Calzada. We're based in Austin, Texas, uh, and we were founded exclusively with the focus of bringing ARM technology uh, into servers and into the data center. Um, uh, we actually were seed funded by ARM, so we've got a tremendous relationship and partnership um, with ARM, um, and it's an exciting time uh, in the data center. The last five years, I've been spending a lot of my time helping to build the software ecosystem around ARM and ARM servers. You'll see some uh, examples of that today, uh, and I'm part of the advisory board uh, for the, the Zen uh, group here at Linux Foundation. I'm going to cover a range of things today. I want to first start from a market perspective um, and, and really give you the sense of why this is a significant movement now um, and tying it to workload and usage. Because that's one of the questions we get a lot in terms of um, what's ARM uh, good for in the data center, what's the fit, and, and show you some of the progressions on where we're going. Talk a little bit about technology trends um, that are foundational to what we're doing. And then from there, look at some roadmaps, because I think that's a good anchor relative to understanding um, both a hardware and software perspective from um, key contributing elements um, to this space. And talk, obviously, a little bit about Zen. Um, out of all the presentations today, this may be the least Zen heavy, but that's OK, because you've got the right people filling in all the uh, elements around it. And talk a little bit about where we go from here. So let me start by um, looking at kind of classic enterprise IT workloads and think about it at two levels. Um, think about it at scale of application and think about volume in the segment. Um, so a number of classic uh, examples here on your upper left, IT infrastructure, which really um, historically has driven the volume in the enterprise space, but not necessarily the scale of the application. Contrast that to decision support, which has really driven uh, more of the scale, but here it's been scale up instead of scale out. And so as you think of these workloads, the kinds of figures of merit that matter are typically peak compute performance, peak single thread performance. Um, power hasn't really been a focus area, um, and so you see that in terms of cost of um, owning some of the, the, the heavier duty, big iron systems. Um, you see that in terms of some of the challenges of running the data centers. And as we think about virtualization, it's more about consolidation than uh, management or operational efficiencies. So that's really where, where we've been historically. But as you think about where we are and where we're going, um, the intersection of um, kind of classic Web 2.0 workloads where historically, um, you know, we're really thinking about big data analytics, scale out storage, um, large web tier, really changes how you look at these workloads and where um, the growth is going. 
and then uh, you add the cloud element to this and moving those workloads into the cloud, it changes how you think about scale and it changes how you think about volume um, in, from, a, from a segment standpoint. And those figures of merit really kind of get flipped on their side. Um, in a lot of those um, workloads, it's now less about single CPU performance and more about collective throughput um, and I.O. Um, I.O. becomes such an element of efficiency and capability. And in a lot of these, especially big data workloads where you're moving a lot of data around, it's how fast can I get in and how fast can I get out, and much heavier on the, the compute itself. Um, operational efficiency becomes huge, power. Um, so the, the cost of running the data center, the cost of acquisition um, becomes less. The cost of acquisition becomes less than that cost of ownership if you don't do it right. Uh, and so we'll talk uh, a, a lot more in detail in terms of how that really plays out. Um, also the operational efficiency in terms of how do I manage, how do I control, how do I provision um, becomes a much bigger metric in terms of how I evaluate success here. Other things like PUE, how do I measure efficiency of the data center as a whole? Um, do I have uh, governments getting involved in, um, you know, from uh, carbon uh, to overall um, uh, power footprints um, to even um, control within the data center and power per rack uh, footprints? So it, it's really changed how you build data centers, how you operate, and how you measure. This is a core driver to why we start to look differently at the underlying architecture of servers and how we start to look differently at how we invest around that. So I showed you growth from the, the application perspective, but look at the market and the projections of where we are. So um, over the next few years, projections are that the dollar spend for servers will continue to grow, but in a much flatter rate. But within the overall server market, the growth of those Web 2.0 workloads becomes significant to the degree of um, about 40% by 2016. So it's massive and accelerated growth within that space, but actually decreasing within uh, outside of that space within the server market. Now, within the Web 2.0 space, projections are that 40% of that space will become microservers or um, ultra low power server based. Um, and so we're going from basically a zero to about $9 billion spend in four or five years. Huge growth, huge change in terms of um, what that means to the data center, what that means to the DevOps guys, and what that means to the development community. Um, and one of the key drivers and one of the key areas of interest um, for all those reasons that I talked about in terms of figures of merit and, and capability is the underlying ARM architecture. Um, so we've got this interesting thread of 40, 40, 40. That'll be an easy quiz, right? So 40% of the market becoming Web 2.0, 40% in that space becoming um, mic uh, low, ultra low power or microservers and 40% interest in ARM. So what's the relevance of ARM? Um, well, first and foremost, the ARM architecture and design comes out of a mobile technology perspective. And the focus um, on energy efficiency is intense. And I, I've kind of learned this firsthand. So my background has um, really been exclusively servers, um, HPC high-end uh, type servers. The other two co-founders of Calzada have come out of the uh, ARM space X scale. David Borland um, drove a lot of uh, designs and, and delivered a great product on that space. Uh, Barry Evans was GM on the business side. And as, as we built the company and as we spent a lot of time together, um, I was continually reminded if we ever wasted a milliwatt. And for a server guy in the HPC space, that's a rounding error. Um, but if you're coming out of that mobile space and you worry about battery life and capability, you care about every single milliwatt. And a lot of times look at the question, what's, you know, what's the big home run for you? There isn't a single home run. 
it's a collection of many, many, many optimizations to save each and every milliwatt. Um, so that performance energy trade-off is a continuum in this space. Performance per watt per dollar is the metric that really drives um, investment and, and purchase. Um, the arm space pioneered the system on chip capability. Uh, I'm gonna go in a lot more detail in terms of what that really means, but it's an ability to integrate um, all of your core IP into a single piece of silicon, which gives great efficiency, but also allows you a level of flexibility and um, frankly creativity on design. And then at a, at a very fine grain level, things like um, power clock, frequency gating, um, the number of power domains within an ARM architecture chip is significant. In, in one of our chips, we're up to about 20 power domains that are constantly going on and off and they're architected at a level um, of efficiency that you're not paying the price for turning on those domains because they're small enough and they're control enough, controllable enough and granular enough. Now, the other thing that's happened is the performance demands in that mobile space have um, really taken off. Um, and it, it's no surprise, you guys know it as well as anybody, from, from tablets to higher performing cell phones Apple's announcement last week was 64-bit V8-based um, iPhones. Um, you're seeing tremendous push in that space. And we saw that in the 2007-2008 timeframe with the Cortex-A9 from ARM, where you started to see performance at a level that could drive those workloads that are more I.O. driven, again, and less on the peak CPU. Okay, so let's, that kind of sets the tone relative to the market and um, some of the dynamics of, of where we've been and, and where we're going. So let's talk a little bit more from a technology standpoint. I think it's a really interesting graph um, that shows historical trend over the last 30 plus years of single core performance growth. Um, in the heyday from the late 80s to the early 2000s, we were sustaining 52% per year, year over year performance improvement at single core. Pretty stunning. Um, but now, as we've gotten really into the last five, six, seven years, you start to see that tapering off. Um, it's still pretty impressive at 22% per year, um, but we're starting to hit some walls from um, uh, manufacturing walls to um, uh, other design elements that we've, we've already run through. So you think about how that workload priority is changing. You're also seeing the technology pieces start to change around it. So while at the same time that single core performance growth is slowing, the demand from the workload in the I.O. space is skyrocketing. Um, and and a, a, just a couple of examples here. So. Think about distributed application level storage. Um, great examples are, are Ceph and Gluster. There's other open source um, examples as well. Um, but in a world where we don't want to throw any data away, um, it's amazing the um, growth rate at, in this storage layer at a time where the high-end um, kind of classic storage uh, providers are really getting attacked from the low end with this, uh, you know, what, what's being known as software-defined storage um, using commodity hardware. Now, when people talk about commodity hardware in the storage space, what they really mean is a commodity CPU. But the I.O. around it from the networking and drive support certainly is not commodity because of the demands on that system. A um, couple of other factors that are, are really interesting here. So I'm going to talk more about fabrics in, in, a, in a little bit. But one of the aspects of some of this scale-out storage are some algorithms that really go more in an east-west traffic pattern than north-south. So what that means is you care more about the traffic to your nearest neighbor back and forth. Well, in a classic cluster world, that means I've got to go top a rack switch and back down or maybe out to another rack. Latency, um, loss of bandwidth can be significant. In a fabric world, with a much tighter integration on a cluster, uh, 
that path to your nearest neighbor or nearest set of neighbors can be really short-circuited. So again, the architecture around the underlying base to support the kind of scale out, in this case storage, um, is a, a mapping that really comes together well. And again, is much less about peak compute than collective throughput. So now that I've got all that storage, here comes big data from the analytics side. Um, Hadoop obviously is um, the, the space that gets a lot of attention um, with the combination of map and reduce. And, and frankly, I really think the storage guys end up winning this battle because if you're investing that kind of money and that kind of real estate and storage, I'm going to optimize around that. Hadoop's a starting point, but frankly, it's wild, wild west here. Um, and there's a lot of interesting innovation um, coming around um, in this space as well. Now, if you look at the uh, kind of classic benchmarks, we're also going away from um, just simple spec int, spec CPU, um, or kind of a classic, what used to be called dusty decks in the HPC space with uh, a lot of Fortran and other codes like that, to um, really kind of a next generation of benchmarks. So one that I'd like to call out is Graph 500, which still comes out of the HPC space, but very intense on the data side. So graph model type analysis, uh, network type model, um, and you're seeing a lot more attention and focus there because it really represents these kinds of workloads, these kinds of challenges from the scale out space that are pushing um, where we're going in this market. So now let me come back to the system on chip that I touched on earlier. So in the ARM architecture world, um, by virtue of the type of IP and the delivery mechanism from ARM, I can take a standard ARM core and build around it in the silicon an optimized solution. So that's what's been happening in the embedded space for a long, long time. Um, and it, it could be specialized peripherals, could be offload engines, um, could be GPU accelerators, really depends on um, what your target market is, what your domain expertise is as a company and as a target market. And it really creates a thriving competitive market because of that flexibility, yet with a standard building block. And so one example um, that certainly Calzade is focused on is the management space for servers. So in addition to the ARM core, we have an additional core in every SOC that delivers um, high value, standard server management, controlled via IPMI, which is well accepted in the data center, um, but bundled in to every single SOC. So I don't need a separate card um, or a separate system for that management. And because it's integrated, the granularity and low level control that I have is way beyond what I could get by uh, some separate uh, box or chip. So that includes power optimization. I mentioned the power domain aspect before, turning on and off power domains. Um, I'll talk about fabric and how we can control that dynamically or based on policies, how I handle provisioning, how I handle boot. Um, it's that optimization. And, and by the way, by embedding that and baking that in, I mask away that complexity from the end user and from the data center operator. So all I care about is IPMI. And by the way, standard IPMI with standard custom extensions that are approved and, and a, a, a well-accepted model um, within the IPMI standard itself. And by the way, when you're thinking of um, literally thousands of these in a rack, any concept of attached display or serial uh, cables or keyboard video mouse type of um, support and service is long gone. Um, it, it is not the support model that you're going to see. It doesn't make sense um, for this kind of density and, and model, which I'll, I'll continue to talk about. So fabrics is the other space that uh, Calzade has chosen to invest in, and you're really seeing as um, a, a core of the, the, the next generation of server architecture. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, all you have to do is look at that picture in the lower right with uh, cabling strung throughout. We've all seen it, uh, unfortunately, probably in our own um, physical uh, locations. So uh, we know what that means. But um, 
Back to that SOC, if now I can also bake in fabric technology that allows, what I, and I'll go into this, but transparent and reconfigurable interconnect, node to node, greatly decreases cost and decreases power for what I'm designing. Um, so what that means is I don't need an Ethernet cable coming off of every chip. I don't need um, the, uh, the, the, the control or the, the port costs that I would have to pay otherwise because I've baked it in in the silicon itself. I can make the connection on my system board and I can control it via software so that I can dynamically affect the routes. I can dynamically optimize where I want to carry traffic and I'm not plugging in and removing cables. So it's, it's a significant step forward and again, a mapping to that workload that we care about. I can build in redundancy. I can build in different topologies. I can enable um, system partners to create um, appliances and, and workload optimized systems that leverage different fabric implementations based on the kind of workload that we care about. And because those volumes are so large in individual workloads, it's well worth that kind of investment. I used the example of erasure coding before in terms of um, on the storage side of, of removing that top of rack dependency, um, but then also even removing the top of rack completely and being able to expand fabrics beyond an individual rack, um, it, it really changes the dynamics and the metrics as you think of latency and bandwidth. So today we're running up to 10 gig uh, bandwidth uh, node to node on our fabric, but we can all also ratchet it down dynamically down to one gig uh, and with incremental steps in between. Um, and, and so the, the concept million node data centers is not far away. So now as you think about virtualization and, and control and somebody, uh, I think the first presentation this morning talked about breaking the 1024 barrier for a number of VMs. Um, when you think about uh, a million nodes in a cluster, um, we're, we're at a whole new uh, type of level there. So let's use, and, and, and I'm not here for a Calzada uh, commercial, but I just want to use our energy core as an example of a system on chip. And, and what that really translates to. So there's really four building blocks that we integrate on our server. The upper right is the CPU complex from ARM. So in this case, it's uh, an ARM Cortex-A9, integrated L2 cache, uh, and integrated memory controller. On the lower right is our fabric switch. Um, and that is, think of it as an eight port L2 switch um, that's probably the best analogy I would use with five ports coming off of the chip. So I can connect up to five other SOCs to that SOC. So any topology you can create with five links, go for it. Lower left is I.O. integration. So SATA, PCIe, up to 10 gig Ethernet, uh, SD&E, MMC, all integrated in the silicon. So I don't need a separate chip for I.O. I don't need um, separate uh, chips throughout system design, all integrated here as well. And then finally, our management engine. So I mentioned that before, but this is a separate core, separate from um, where I'm running Linux and my Linux stack. So there's security benefits, there's control benefits, and there's operational benefits, again, by integrating, but also by separating from the core itself. So that simplicity and that integration translates to benefits of system design as well, um, both in terms of decreasing complexity and also improving efficiency. So here's one example of one form factor. So in about a 10-inch card, we've got four of our SOCs. Um, think of it as a, a four-server cluster, no cables. All, um, all in, you can see simplicity in terms of, that's all I need from a design perspective. Um, in this case, I've got um, four gig of DDR per SOC for a total of 16 on that one card. And I support up to four SATA drives per SOC. And all my power, my SATA, my fabric, all comes through the connectors that go into a passive 
system board. So cluster four servers, five watts about per SOC. So I've got four servers at 20 watts. And an example configuration on the lower right, that's actually one of the um, moonshot systems from HP. That's a 4U with 288 servers, 288 nodes in that 4U. Changes your metric for density if you think about 10 of those 4Us in a standard rack um, in terms of um, capability and um, what, you can, what you can build into a single rack. Now I included the um, Open Compute logo here as well. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of Open Compute, it's a project started um, really initially by Facebook. And think of it as open source for hardware. Um, a, a community effort to look at designs around systems in a different way. So some different form factors for racks. Um, looking at power optimization as it relates to power supplies in a different way. And it is um, changing the way the industry looks at system design as well, which is a great intersection in terms of how we're looking at the individual SOC or, or node level. Um, and it's really called out, uh, typically in the industry, is for exclusively to the high, um, super hyperscale guys like a Facebook. But we're really seeing adoption um, in much broader segments than that um, that really doesn't get talked about as much publicly but I think you're really gonna to continue to see traction there. So let's talk about roadmaps, um, starting with ARM. Talked about A9 going back to um, really 2008, 2009. Uh, the Cortex A15 right in the middle here is uh, are, are really the systems that are um, now starting to ship in the server space. Um, there's a couple of key things that the A15 brings to market. One is larger physical address space. So we're still in a 32-bit virtual world, but now we're in a 40-bit physical world. What that translates to is more physical memory per SOC, and in particular, more physical memory per core. So I can move to typically a two or four gig per core model um, beyond where in an A9 I was limited to a single gig per core. Also of relevance for, in particular today, is the virtualization support. So with the A15, um, ARM has what's called an MMU400. That's their standard IP um, that provides the um, hardware virtualization hooks um, that are key as we um, push the virtualization space uh, forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and then following is the A57 A50, and A53. So this is the V8 of the ARM architecture. And what the industry is getting um, extremely excited about is full 64-bit uh, delivery. Um, and, and so certainly there are server workloads um, that really just plain require 64-bit. Um, and um, this is the, the space that we'll see those additional workloads starting to come over. And on each of these iterations, we're seeing improved performance um, as well, both at the core but also uh, on the memory side. Um, and I, I should also mention that exiting 2012, I think the number was 40 billion ARM devices in the world, um, a pretty stunning number. Um, so I think the ARM architecture is, is here to stay for a while longer. So that's the hardware. Let's talk about um, on the software side. A lot of questions always in terms of, hey, that's great, but um, what do you have from a software ecosystem? And, and I'm really thrilled to say that this has um, really built momentum over the last couple of years. Uh, from the Linux distro standpoint, we worked closely with Canonical from the beginning. Canonical has been um, closely collaborating with ARM going back to 2008 with Ubuntu. Uh, in 2011, you started to see early releases supporting ARM servers um, and, and fully in place since 1204 with the LTS uh, long-term support uh, release model that Canonical has. Um, and we're, we'll be seeing 1310 come out here shortly with full support for A15 and virtualization and, and large physical memory. Um, major progress in the Fedora space as well. So we work closely with Red Hat and Fedora. Um, we, although not technically um, you know, publicly stated, in reality, ARM's really being treated as a primary architecture now within Fedora going into the Fedora 20 release. Um, we've got a number of systems in the build um, center in, in Phoenix in their, in their data center that support uh, 
all the tools, all the infrastructure needed to really hit that primary level. Um, and now uh, F-19 came out on ARM the same day it came out in X-86, which was a first. Um, so that's been um, a major uh, progress from that standpoint. Similar on the SUSE side with OpenSUSE, um, 12.2 was um, well supported on ARM. 12.3 uh, is out now. We're similar to with F-20 on, on A-15. We'll see 12.3 plus um, on, uh, on A-15 as well. And then CentOS, uh, I'll just say watch this space. The guy speaking after me today will be able to touch in a lot more depth on CentOS, but we are um, excited about figuring out um, opportunities for CentOS support uh, on this architecture as well. It's a, it's a great match, um, especially as you think about some of the workloads that, that you see in the CentOS space. Okay, so now from the Zen and virtualization side, and um, this has really moved very quickly when, when you really think about it. So 2011, um, thanks to Ian and Stefano and, and, and some of the team with Citrix, we had our first working um, code for Cortex-A15 um, on uh, emu emulation for supporting hardware virtualization. Um, in 2012, um, Lenaro, so let me step back for a second. Lenaro is a industry group started by ARM back in 2010. Um, originally started with, uh, I think, about five silicon vendors, all delivering ARM silicon to the market, but primarily on the embedded client side. The real driver was to improve ARM's ability and capability in the Linux space. At that time, um, Linus had some pretty uh, uh, tough uh, words uh, for that community. And um, so there's really been a chance to pull together a collective engineering effort around optimizing and delivering um, Linux in that space. 2012, we formed um, specifically a working group called Lenaro Enterprise Group, focused on servers, including not only silicon guys like Helzeta, um, but also OS, so Canonical and Red Hat, um, OEMs, HP, and users Facebook. Um, so that's a pretty stellar group when you think of the investment and the commitment um, to that open source support um, around Lenaro. Citrix joined uh, early in 2013. Um, there is a virtualization group within LEG focused specifically on driving um, Zen and, and other virtualization capabilities in the ARM space. And now uh, this year we've, we've already talked about Zen Project. Um, Calzada was one of the um, founding groups um, for Zen Project and in particular to help drive uh, the ARM focus and the support for multiple architectures in that effort. With the 4.3 release this summer, we saw the, really the instantiation of that first real uh, ARM support. And now with 4.4, early next year, um, we're looking at that as, as a really solid release um, for that core virtualization capability. Okay, so advantages for Zen on ARM. Um, one is just the history, uh, quite honestly, of Citrix and ARM. And it's no coincidence of the, the common geo of Cambridge in the UK. Um, I, I think that in, in this industry, that's always a benefit. And so culturally, um, those two organizations click. And having helped drive the, this ecosystem over the last five years, I can tell you there are some cultures that don't click when I talk about ARM and ARM servers, and, and I lose them quickly. Um, but this is one that's been a lot of fun because of that common foundation um, and, and that baseline that, that we're coming from. So there's a lot of cross-pollination there that, that helps. Um, optimizing to a small footprint. So the team at Citrix understood that from the beginning. So the work on ARM, there was a great presentation last year in San Diego um, that, that really went into more detail in terms of lines of code and, and optimization and targets there. So um, that's a key point. Understanding the landing zone as you're doing the design is, is really important. So then you think about, I talked about fabrics and the capability that brings to this architecture, and you think about things like migration. Well, if I've got a low latency, high bandwidth interconnect, and I can uh, migrate around in that cluster, um, that's a great enabler and that's a great combination. As you think about larger clusters and you think about the elements moving around that cluster and maybe migration being more important over time, I really like that as a space of some optimization um, and, and improvements that, you know, frankly, I think we, we are kind of thinking about now and just scratching the surface. So, so that, that's just one example of where 
I believe the combinations of the technologies are really going to play well off of each other. Um, also, the consistent management is, is critical. So I like to talk about removing friction when I introduce a new architecture to a data center. Um, it's kind of like walking in and saying, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread as long as you change your compiler and your OS and everything you've ever done. Um, it's a short discussion. It's a much better discussion if I can come in and say, hey, for the most part, everything's just going to work. If you've got Java code, it's going to work. If you're using IPMI, it's going to work. If you're using um, standard Linux, distro, Linux distros, it's going to work. If you're using Zen from a management provision control standpoint, it's going to work. So that's a key piece of how you look at bringing in this very disruptive technology in a way that doesn't disrupt how people go about their job. So let's talk about um, specifically an, an example and um, how we look at OpenStack um, on Zen. There was a comment this morning, I think, in terms of one of the presentations that somebody was surprised that uh, OpenStack was even working with Zen. Well, it's, it's really um, a, a great combination for us because of the underlying pinning that Zen brings to the table because of the optimization that we talked about and private cloud instances on an ARM server in that scale that you think about where we're going in those workloads is, um, we think, an, an excellent combination. So with Havana coming out this fall with 13.10, Canonical, Ubuntu, and by the way, the Canonical team's done a lot in the OpenStack space, so great combination there. And with the 4.3.4.4 releases um, with Zen, this is a, a, an, an absolute priority for Calzada and the partners that we're working with. So in particular, you know, we could take advantage of that common existing management and use those APIs to, to control and, and move things around, knowing that we're going to have a production quality, production grade hypervisor uh, with support of, of the, uh, the full community. Um, and I, I can't tell you how important that is as we go out and, and talk to, to new users um, in, in existing space. So in closing, um, I, I'll say this is disruption to the, to the data center space on legal steroids, not the illegal kind. Um, we're looking at an efficient core architecture, um, that integration, the SOC at the pieces that matter that also enable um, great innovation and competition in this space. You're not going to see a monopoly in the, in the ARM server space with the kind of competition capabilities that, that we all bring to the table. Open source software, obviously, but also open source hardware as we think about um, things like open compute and those changing workloads. And, and we're just, like I said, wild, wild west early um, on, on those workloads themselves. And so where do we go from here? Well, that ARM roadmap, that was the public one. The private one is even more exciting. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on there. ARM is continuing to invest more and more in that architecture as it relates to, to servers in the data center. Um, the ecosystem is simply accelerating. We've got more and more projects and programs and capabilities going. Um, and it's all about that workload with integrated efficiency and optimization that, that really makes a difference. Questions? Yeah. So it goes up to 10 gig. It's um, about 200 nanosecond latency point to point. And we can um, adjust down to 1 gig um, dynamically based on if it's a policy um, or maybe um, policy from the standpoint of, you know, at midnight from, from midnight to 6, I'm going to ratchet it down just to save power because my demand's lower. Or I can optimize to certain sections of a cluster based on workload, for example, as well. Five ten gig coming off the part, and in addition, supporting ten gig Ethernet. So you can optionally have Ethernet on any of your nodes as well. So think of a you know your your egress coming out of a system. So the uh, core server or the energy core processor, what? process is that on, if you can tell me? Sure. And is there an FPGA component or is it all ASIC? Sure. So 40 nanometer process today. Um, candidly, we've been fairly conservative mm -hmm. because we don't really think the process is what matters. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at more of the you know, high volume um, op optimized from that standpoint. And your question about FPGA, now this is all in okay. silicon, so there's, there's no FPGA element at all in, in terms of any of the, the parts. 
Got time for one more question? Has anyone suggested that your Dent server is sort of replacing the need for uh, software virtualization by the fact that you just have so many processors in a, in a 4U box? Yeah, um, so bare metal is, yeah. is certainly an option. Um, and until we had A15, that was kind of the thing we only talked about because that's that was the the leverage we had now um, there are workloads and there are, are certainly environments where um, people are going to be happy with bare metal and stick with it um, and and it's what we want to be able to do is provide that range of support so you know we've got bare metal we've got linux containers we've got zen we've got kvm so the range of capability is there um, and it, it really comes down to workload and operational environment. So if I'm, um, think of if I have a fully dedicated cluster for nothing but um, Hadoop, it's, it's going to run bare metal, probably. Um, but that same user may want to have um, the ability to actually execute that in a private cloud um, in a virtualized environment. So it's, it's the flexibility that, the, that they kind of want. Yeah. So, uh, God, was loud, was <laughs> uh, uh, virtualization, I mean, uh, the way I look at it is there's two things you get with virtualization. One is consolidation, um, which obviously we're used to on, on big systems. Um, but the other one, which is more relevant to the smaller systems, is abstraction. Um, so even in a world where there's one VM per host, and I, I know of a number of examples of that happening on large x86 systems at the moment, the fact that we've got something between the workload and the hardware gives us hook points for software defined networking so doing sort of open flow type stuff um, abstraction around the sort of storage we can use so uh, typically a bare metal workload is going to be limited by uh, the the local storage available in a node or what the OS can natively do like iSCSI boot for example whereas if say you want to use Ceph um, or, or you know you want to bring in something that maybe you haven't already got hardware integration for um, the hypervisor of, uh, allows you to much more flexibly uh, use storage and then things like the, the migration element even in a web 2.0 world where your VMs are tolerant are failure tolerant um, being able to move things around at a finer granularity for load balancing maintenance etc I think it's quite a nice uh, facility so I think that sort of as long as it's low overhead and low cost um, I think that, that abstraction is very, very useful. Okay, uh, that's all the time we have right now. Let's give Larry a, a good round of applause.